The Amazing Brain, Part 2, by Robert Ornstein. The Divided Brain. You can go on a walk with them, swim, eat dinner, even ride while they're driving, and you don't notice anything. You wonder what that radical brain surgery is about. They seem normal. Their coordination is fine. Their reason is unimpaired. Their ability to dance, to walk, to sing even is fine. One of them can even play the piano better than the scientist interviewing them. But these people have had a most radical brain operation for epilepsy. It has split their brain. The results have caused a revolution in the understanding of the most evolved part of the brain, the cortex. To go back to the beginning of the story, in 1834 and 1835, Mark Dax, a French physician, began to collect evidence on people who had lost speech due to brain injury, the condition known as aphasia. In reviewing his cases, Dax noticed that all of them had brain damage to the left side. He undertook a search of the literature and of his colleagues' experiences, since Dax was an ordinary doctor, something similar to our general practitioner, and was not well versed in the neurology of his day. There were no cases of aphasia which did not involve the left hemisphere, as far as he could find, although some of his cases, of course, had damage to the right hemisphere as well. There was a strong association with damage to the left hemisphere and the loss of language. The response to Dax's report was underwhelming. He received no notice, and his contribution seemed to be forgotten. But, as in many important findings in science, the finding was waiting to be rediscovered. The cerebral cortex is divided in much the same way in all primates. The rat's brain is divided, as is that of the cat and the monkey. But the two hemispheres of these animals do not seem to have different functions. In the 19th century, the idea began to arise that the brain was not just an amorphous lump of tissue, as the Greeks had thought, but the different areas of the brain might have different functions. Evidence began to mount that this was indeed the case, and it would have been accepted further had the understanding of that evidence not been faulty. For the proponents of cerebral localization, as it was then called, were also the proponents of the idea of phrenology. The doctrine of phrenology contained the idea that bumps on the surface of the head mirrored differences in the size of the underlying brain tissue underneath. Thus, the kind of brain a person has would then be red, so to speak, on the skull. Different areas of the brain were assigned different functions and representations on the head. This idea had two fatal flaws. It was easily tested, and it was wrong. Thus, the idea that the hemispheres had different functions was buried in the controversy over the obviously inane phrenology, another false setback. The problem began to be settled by Paul Broca some 20 to 30 years after Dax had presented his careful report. As an unwilling participant in the phrenology controversy, Broca had simply begun to examine the brains of people who had known cases of speech loss. His cases had a similar pattern. He presented eight very carefully studied and documented cases, all of which had speech loss and all of which had damage in the left frontal lobe. This area became known as Broca's area, one of the parts of the brain involved in speech production. It was the first generally accepted evidence on brain asymmetry to the chagrin of Dax's son, who mounted a campaign to revive interest in his father's primacy. But the field was established by Broca's careful work, and so, for more than a century now, the neurological evidence has come from the study of people whose brains have been damaged by accident or illness and from the surgery performed on them. It is then in the work of clinical neurology and neurosurgery that the primary indications of hemispheric specialization are to be found. 
After reading Broca in 1864, the great neurologist Hewlings Jackson concluded that the left hemisphere was the seat of the faculty of expression and noted of a patient with a tumor in the right hemisphere that she did not know objects, persons, and places. Since Hewlings Jackson, many other neurologists, neurosurgeons, and psychiatrists have confirmed that two different modes of thought seem to be lateralized in the two cerebral hemispheres of human beings. In thousands of clinical cases studied, damage to the left hemisphere very often interferes with and can in some cases completely destroy language ability. An injury to the right hemisphere does not destroy language in most cases, but may cause severe disturbance in spatial awareness, in musical ability, in the recognition of other people, and in the awareness of one's own body. For instance, some patients with right hemisphere damage cannot dress themselves adequately, although their speech and reason remain unimpaired. In precise neuropsychological studies, Brenda Milner and her associates at McGill University in Montreal have attempted to correlate disorders in specific kinds of tasks with damage to specific areas of the brain. For example, removal of the right temporal lobe severely impairs the person's ability to find his way out of a maze, while left temporal lobe damage of an equal extent produces little loss. These researchers also report that damage to specific parts of the brain results in specific kinds of language disorders. For instance, an impairment of verbal memory is associated with damage in the front of the left temporal lobe. Speech impairment seems to result from damage to the rear of the left temporal lobe. On less empirical grounds, the Russian philologist A.R. Luria writes that mathematical function is also disturbed by lesions of the left side. Dr. Milner and her associates find that the recognition of musical pitch seems to be in the province of the right hemisphere. Other laboratories report a loss of the ability to recognize faces with the damage to the rear of the right hemisphere. The clinical neurological research is intriguing. It correlates the different functions of the hemispheres that are impaired by brain damage. But perhaps the most intriguing still is the research of Roger Sperry of the California Institute of Technology and his associates, notably Dr. Joseph Bogan. Sperry's work even intrigued the Nobel Prize Committee enough to win him the prize in 1981. The two cerebral hemispheres communicate through the corpus callosum, which joins the two sides anatomically. Sperry and his colleagues had for some years experimentally severed the corpus callosum in laboratory animals. This allowed the hemispheres to be trained independently. This research led to the adoption of a radical treatment for severe epilepsy in several patients of Drs. Philip Vogel, and Joseph Bogan of the California College of Medicine. This treatment involved an operation on human beings similar to Sperry's experimental surgery on animals, a cutting of the interconnections between the two cerebral hemispheres, effectively isolating one side from the other. This surgery came to be called split-brain surgery. The hope of the researchers in doing the surgery was that when a patient had a seizure in one hemisphere, the transmission of that seizure between the hemispheres would be lessened, and so the seizures would diminish. The surgery worked, and in most cases, the severely disturbed patients were improved enough to leave the hospital to drive, to walk, to talk, to swim, as I mentioned earlier. In day-to-day -day living, then, these split-brain people exhibit almost no abnormality, which is somewhat surprising in view of their radical surgery. However, Sperry and Bogan developed several ingenious and subtle tests that showed that the operation had clearly separated the specialized functions of the two cerebral hemispheres. For instance, if the patient held a pencil hidden from sight in his right hand, he could verbally describe it, as would be normal. 
but if the pencil was in his left hand, he couldn't describe it at all. Recall that the left hand informs the right hemisphere, which possesses only a limited capability for speech. With the corpus callosum severed, the verbal hemisphere, the left, is no longer connected to the right hemisphere, which communicates largely with the left hand. If, however, the patient was offered a set of objects, a key, book, pencil, and so on, and was asked to select the previously given object with his left hand, he could choose correctly, although he still could not state verbally just what he was doing. This situation closely resembles what might happen if I were secretly asked to perform an action and you were expected to discuss the action, about which you'd been told nothing. Normally, when we wish to inquire about the knowledge of another person, we allow the verbal apparatus to determine it. We reduce our knowledge to that which a person can report. The preceding example is a primary indication that doing so can be a fundamental error. We are aware of more than we can discuss. This is one of the most important implications of the split-brain experiments. Another experiment in Sperry's lab tested the lateral specialization of the two hemispheres using split visual input. The eyes are divided as well as the brain. The right half of each eye sends its messages to the right hemisphere. The left half of each eye sends its messages to the left hemisphere. In this experiment, the word heart was flashed before the patient with the he to the left and the art to the right. Normally, if you were asked to report this experience, you would report having seen heart. But the split-brain patients responded differently, depending upon which hemisphere was responding. When the patient was asked to name the word just presented, he replied art, since this was the portion projected to the left hemisphere, which was answering the question. When, however, the patient was shown two cards, one with the word he the other with the word art, and was asked to point with the left hand to the word just seen, the left hand pointed to he. The simultaneous experience, or at least expression, of each sphere seemed unique and independent of each other in these patients. The verbal hemisphere gave one answer, the nonverbal hemisphere another. One of the most dramatic instances of the superior ability of the right hemisphere was captured on film by Roger Sperry and one of his colleagues. The patient was given a set of blocks with different divisions of red and white paint on the sides. He was asked to assemble those blocks to match certain patterns, which he then sees. The patient begins well with his left hand. He puts blocks into more and more complex patterns. Then he's asked to begin to assemble those blocks with his right hand. Most people assume that it would be quite easy to do the same patterns with another hand. After all, the person has just seen himself doing it. However, the right hand has great difficulty. Even in the simplest of patterns, it turns over the block seemingly at random. At one point in Sperry's film, the patient turns over a block to complete a pattern. But he then continues to turn it over and makes an incorrect pattern, much to the viewer's dismay. But here is the interesting part. The patient's left side is also dismayed. The left hand appears, furtively, on the side, and attempts to correct the right, only to be chastised by the experimenter. Everything we have seen, Roger Sperry writes of his studies, indicates that the surgery has left these people with two separate minds, that is, with two separate spheres of consciousness. And it should be noted, these spheres are quite different. One seems to be able to express itself in words, the other in drawing and in space. But the question remained, do normal people operate this way, or is the split brain just a unique surgical production? These spectacular split-brain and lesion studies are not the only evidence for the physiological duality of mind. In general, great caution should be exercised in drawing inferences to normal function from pathological and surgical cases alone. In dealing with these cases, 
we must remember that we are investigating disturbed, not normal functioning, and the connection to normal functioning may be a bit tenuous. In cases of brain damage, it is never fully clear, for instance, that one hemisphere has not taken over a function from the other to an unusual degree simply because of the injury. In the case of the surgical patients, they are by definition quite atypical due to their epilepsy. So to complete this story, it is necessary to get evidence from normally functioning people, even if that evidence is necessarily more indirect, since we don't go around poking inside the brains of our friends. In this case, we are fortunate that recent research with normal people has confirmed much of the neurosurgical explorations. The evidence comes from many sources, tests of vision, eye movements, reaction time, ear preference, and electrical signs of brain asymmetry. When I began my research, it seemed necessary to try and develop an easy method to study whether the normal brain actually does make use of the lateral specialization it shows when split. I was very lucky in doing this because the brain was built upwards from the brain stem. Each layer of this ramshackle house was placed over the previous one. This means that the most interesting parts of the brain, the different parts of the cortex, are right under the skull, and the activity of the brain can be actually recorded by placing sensitive electrodes on the surface of the skull. This recording is called the electroencephalogram, or EEG, as it is known in the trade. The EEG consists of an examination of the voltage that the brain produces as recorded on the surface of the skull. So the voltage is very low, of the order of only a few millionths of a volt. The EEG is not a precise measure. It is rather crude, like recording the overall noise that a city produces. If you did so record a city's noise, for instance, you might find a few things. You might find that there are large amounts of noise in the center of the city from 9 to 5. Then there's more noise in outlying areas after dark, and there is very little noise in the city after midnight. But you would hardly use this crude overall noise measure to determine anything very subtle, such as what the inhabitants were going to do about the next election. The EEG is similarly used to tell us only when one part of the brain is noisy, active. The idea in my experiments was that if the brain of a normal person turned on and off different hemispheres while thinking, then by recording the EEG from both hemispheres of a normal person working at a cognitive task, I might be able to see a sign of the selective activation and suppression of these two hemispheres. My colleague at the time, David Gallen, and I tried out these ideas on a trusting medical student assigned to us one summer. We outfitted him with EEG electrodes over the left and right temporal and parietal areas and asked him to perform verbal and spatial tasks, to write a letter, and to arrange a set of colored blocks to match a given pattern, much the same tasks as the split-brain patients were given. The findings were immediate and very striking. While he was writing, presumably a left hemisphere task, our student produced a high amplitude EEG over the right hemisphere and produced much less amplitude over the left hemisphere. The high amplitude seemed to be contributed mainly by the alpha rhythm, waves at approximately 10 cycles per second. This pattern reversed while he was arranging the blocks. The alpha was dominant over the left hemisphere and less visible over the right. The alpha rhythm is generally taken to indicate a diminution of information processing, similar to the noise of a city shutting down. This seemed to be what we were searching for, a measure of the activity of the two hemispheres of a normal person. The left hemisphere quieted down while our student was arranging the blocks, the right hemisphere quieted down while he was writing. We retested him all summer, grabbed other laboratory personnel as well as everybody else we could find for testing, 
and we found similar results. Their EEG showed for each cognitive mode that the area of the brain not being used was relatively turned off. With these results in mind, we considered the many difficulties other researchers have encountered in attempting to relate the EEG to intelligence, cognition, and consciousness. We had fortunately attended to several factors which seem to have been neglected in the past. One, we recorded EEG while the subject was actually engaged in his task rather than trying to relate an EEG recorded while he was resting to subsequent performance. Two, we selected cognitive tasks which clinical evidence has shown to depend more on one hemisphere than the other and which therefore would be associated with a predictable pattern of brain activity. Three, we selected the EEG electrode placements on anatomical grounds. A wealth of evidence suggested that temporal and parietal areas of the brain should be the most functionally asymmetrical and the occipital areas the most similar. Unfortunately, occipital EEG leads had been used most often in the past, probably because they are not as sensitive to eye movement and muscle effects. We then recruited ten new people for a formal study of this phenomenon. The people were asked to write a letter, to arrange wooden blocks, to match a design, and also to perform mental versions of these tasks, mental letter, mental matching of forms. We analyzed the results in terms of the ratio of total right hemisphere power to left hemisphere power in both temporal and parietal pairs. We interpreted higher power in the EEG to mean more idling. A high ratio therefore meant more right hemisphere idling and indicated a more active involvement of the left hemisphere in a task. Similarly, a low ratio indicated a more active involvement of the right hemisphere. The technical results were as follows. The ratios were consistently higher for the verbal tasks than for the spatial. This indicated more left hemisphere involvement in verbal tasks and more right hemisphere involvement in spatial tasks. More recent studies in our laboratory and in others using our measure shows that the primary factor in hemispheric specialization is not the type of information, words and pictures versus sounds and shapes, considered, but how the brain processes that information. A recent study compared subjects' brain activity while reading two types of written material, technical passages and folk tales. There was no change in the level of activity in the left hemisphere, but the right hemisphere was more active while the subject was reading the stories than while he was reading the technical material. Technical material is almost exclusively logical. Stories, on the other hand, are simultaneous. Many things happen at once. The sense of a story emerges through a combination of style, plot, and evoked images and feelings. Thus, it appears that language in the form of stories can stimulate activity of the right hemisphere. In another experiment, brain activity was recorded while subjects mentally rotated objects in space. This operation normally involved the right hemisphere. When asked to do this task analytically, by counting the boxes, subjects by and large switched over to their left hemisphere. So people can use their hemispheres differently in the same problem depending on their cognitive style. An important extension of our method is found in the work of Richard Davidson and his colleagues over the past few years. If a person is asked to relive an intensely emotional experience, the hemisphere involved depends on the nature of that emotion. There is a recent and very popular myth which has it that everything good in the world must involve the right hemisphere. However, it is the left hemisphere which seems to be involved in happy and in pleasant emotional experiences and the right which is involved in negative feelings such as anger. This startling finding is made even more so in a further study by Davidson. 
In recording the EEGs of 10-month-old babies, the same result was found. The right hemisphere is more involved in emotions such as anger, the left in happiness. When the baby is smiling, for instance, the left hemisphere is active. There is as yet no real explanation for the differences in hemispheric involvement in emotions, but the speculation runs as follows. The left hemisphere may be involved in fine motor control, the control of large motor movements such as running and throwing. It might be that it was useful once in our evolutionary history to have the control of large movements placed closely in the brain to the locus of negative feelings so that if something had to be done, such as running or hitting, it could be done quite soon. Be that as it may, this finding on emotions is new and important, and one that will further extend our knowledge of how different functions are placed in the different sides of the brain. One important line of recent evidence shows that the functions in the brain of different people are placed differently. Although in most people, language is in the left hemisphere, People with left hemisphere damage can be trained to produce language using their right hemisphere, although this flexibility decreases with age. The right hemisphere takes on language functions in young children who have suffered severe damage to the left hemisphere. Even more startlingly, in the deaf, areas of the temporal cortex that are normally used for the processing of speech sounds are used instead for the processing of visual information. A striking instance of this capacity occurs when a person learns a second language. When the second language is learned, there are intriguing reports that brain organization can sometimes change. In one case, the first language actually migrates from the left hemisphere to the right. In others, the second language may occupy only the right hemisphere or it may be represented in both hemispheres. The brain thus seems flexible and adaptable, and this capacity to change may underlie the differences between the brains of different people. Here we'll consider three important questions, right and left-handers, people of different races, and men and women. The brain of the left-hander is different from that of the right there are three different kinds of brain organization of left-handers. One group seems to have the hemispheres divided, as do right-handers. One group has reversed specialization. And a third has language and spatial abilities in both hemispheres. Whether these findings translate into deficiencies is equivocal. Some studies find both language and spatial defects in left-handed people. Some do not. However, left-handers and their blood relatives do recover from brain damage better than do right-handers, which indicates that their language abilities are most dispersed in the brain. What is less equivocal is the cultural bias against things of the left. The word gauche, meaning awkward, is the French word for left. The word sinister comes from the Latin for left, sinistral. Whether brain differences manifest themselves as personality or intellectual traits is unknown, but the existence of strong brain differences is certain, and perhaps differences in body regulation. Left-handers, for instance, have higher rates of autoimmune diseases than do right-handers. There is a clear genetic difference in left and right-handers, and of course between the sexes. What about race? Are there racial differences in the brain? It is difficult to be completely positive about this, but racial differences actually seem quite unlikely. Race itself, as applied to humans, is a very dubious concept. The genes that specify skin color, for instance, and eye folds, do not appear to be linked with many other genes. And, more importantly, people get their genes from their own parents, not from some hypothetical racial pool. Further, the evidence on intelligence, however it is defined, and race, however it is defined, is so complex that no real judgment can be made. If there are any racial differences, they are easily overcome by training. Not so with sex differences. 
Finally, a most controversial point. There do exist profound differences in men and women's brains, differences that are present often before birth. There have been in recent years many bits of evidence that document differences in behavior and aptitude. Girls are more verbally fluent than boys, less aggressive, have better fine motor control. Boys have better control of the large muscles, are more sensitive to movement, and are more aggressive. What is new is that these behavioral differences have physical expression in the brain. Boys show earlier right hemisphere development than girls. Sandra Whittleson, for instance, asked boys and girls 3 to 13 years old to match held objects to visually presented shapes. At 5 years of age, boys showed superiority on the task with objects held in the left hand compared to the right. Girls, however, do better than boys on left hemisphere tasks in grade school years. In addition to the differences in hemispheric maturation, the hemispheres in males are more specialized than those in females. The representation of analytic and sequential thinking is more present in the left hemisphere of males than in females, and spatial abilities are more lateralized in the right hemisphere of males than females. Thus, damage to the left hemisphere interferes with verbal abilities more in males than in females, and damage to the right hemisphere interferes with spatial abilities more in males than in females. Only recently has an important bit of evidence on the male and female brains been discovered. While examining the corpus callosums of several brains, Christine de Lacoste and her colleagues found that they could begin to identify them as male and female by sight. The corpus callosums of the men and women studied are as different so far as are men's and women's arms. An observer can easily group them into the different sexes by sight alone. The women's corpus callosum is larger than the men's, and it is larger in the back of the brain. This is the area of the brain involved in the transmission of information about movements in space and about visual space in general. It is just the area of the corpus callosum that one might expect to be different, given that spatial abilities, like throwing, seem less lateralized in females. They involve both sides of the brain rather than one. It's also important to note that this difference appears as early as 26 weeks in utero. That is, it is an inborn difference in the major system of brain communication. Whether we will find more differences is another question, but we know now that the hemispheres become physically different in different people, left-handers and right, men and women. These split and whole brain studies of normal people, surgical patients, men and women, right and left-handers, have led to a new conception of human knowledge, consciousness, and intelligence. All of our knowledge cannot be expressed in words, and yet our education is based almost exclusively on the written or spoken word. One reason it is difficult to expand our ideas of education and intelligence may be that as yet we have no standard way of assessing that nonverbal portion of intelligence, that part of the brain that is so prominent in many people. The two ways of knowing are not competitive but are complementary. Without a comprehensive perspective, our ability to analyze may be as useless to us as it is to the right hand of the split-brain patient. Similarly, an intuitive insight is lost unless we have a way to express it. Many people whom we consider unintelligent, retarded, or unhealthy may in fact possess a different kind of brain and may be quite valuable to society. The eminent neurologist Norman Geschwind has put the dilemma this way. One must remember that practically all of us have a significant number of special learning disabilities. For example, I am grossly unmusical and cannot carry a tune. We happen to live in a society in which the child who has trouble learning to read is in difficulty. Yet we have all seen some dyslexic children who draw much better than controls, 
i.e., who have either superior visual perceptual or visual motor skills. My suspicion would be that in an illiterate society, such a child would be in little difficulty and might, in fact, do better because of his superior visual perceptual talents, while many of us who function well here might do poorly in a society in which a quite different array of talents was needed to be successful. As the demands of society change, will we acquire a new group of minimally brain-damaged? We are in a race with ourselves. It is in part a race which takes place within our own brain. Human life and the human brain are different, as far as we know, from other species. This difference is the wellspring of our creativity, as well as being the soul of many of the continual human problems. It results in no small part from that spectacular growth of the human brain within the past few million years. All species have evolved to live within the confines of their original habitat. Different animals have made radical physical adaptations, like flying and hibernation, to suit their own specific environments. However, humans are different. We have gone outside our original confines of Africa and the Fertile Crescent. We now live all over the earth in crowded cities, in freezing weather, in skyscrapers, and even, for brief periods, outside the earth itself. We have not changed biologically in the past 20,000 or so years, but the changes we have made in our own environment are dramatic. We have constructed a new world for ourselves. Cities, let alone airplanes, didn't exist 20,000 years ago. The challenges we face are different from those of any other species. Our environment is changing faster and faster. We humans must adapt to each change we make in our world, and our own ability to make those changes in our world is increasing. So our problem is that our ability to create always leaps ahead of our ability to adapt, and we are forever locked into a cycle of adaptation to unprecedented situations. If there are too many changes in our lives, such as the death of a spouse, a new and a demanding job, a move to a new city, our ability to adapt may be taxed to the limit, and we may become ill. Part of the problem is that ramshackle nature of our brain. Sometimes the brain is capable of handling the challenges of our new environment. Sometimes it isn't. It's quite fashionable now to assert that we are thus living on borrowed time. We are living far beyond our ability to adapt. This is certainly true in part, but as we learn more about the brain, we find that it has an ability to govern our eating, our weight, and our health in even some of the most trying circumstances. The innate nature of the brain's regulation of health is probably the most important discovery in recent brain science. First, some of the problems, then the happy ending. You're watching a murder movie on television. You tense, then relax. Your heart begins to pound. Your mouth gets dry. Your stomach may turn, and your hands get clammy. This may happen several times, just as the killer comes into view, and then he recedes. Finally, it's over, and the killer's captured. You return to your everyday life. But what you went through is the emergency reaction. It is an ancient, innate, already prepared biological reaction. It prepares you for the unexpected. This reaction involves heart rate increases, changes in liver and spleen metabolism, changes in respiration, pupils, muscles. You become ready to react. But when you take a new job or show up for a first date, you react similarly. People activate this reaction far more in contemporary society than ever before in our history. The reaction itself is prehistoric. It's useful for emergency situations, but not when we constantly face minor changes in our lives, like watching a movie on television. The reaction is as out of date as goose flesh. 
which is our body's attempt to keep warm, by raising up a non-existent layer of fur so that that fur might trap the air. In our modern society, however, the number of changes that we experience are far, far greater than those that we were designed for. No one was designed to see 15,000 murders on television before the age of 15 or experience the constant urban noise and changing social conditions. No one was designed to go from the stagecoach to the space shuttle within a lifetime. So we are rooted in our evolutionary past, yet the creativity in our newly grown brain has made us literally reach for the stars. The result is that we too often break in the middle as we move into new and unexpected situations in life. Indeed, it has been found that the more changes we experience, stressful life events like buying a house, moving to a new city, divorce, or marriage, the more likely we are to become ill. Although not everyone who experiences a series of these changes gets ill, this important finding tells us something about our biology and society. Current social conditions are, for too many, beyond their biological limits. For instance, too much life stress can cause heart diseases. The striking rise of heart disease in this century is not entirely due to changes in diet, exercise, cholesterol, and smoking. These factors account for only half the occurrences of heart diseases. Sir William Osler, a physician at the turn of the century, noted that his typical patient with coronary heart disease was not the delicate neurotic person, but the robust, the vigorous in mind and body, the keen and ambitious man, whose engine is always at full speed ahead. People who have heart attacks often appear healthy, but have an exaggerated biological reaction to the stresses of their lives. This has been called type A behavior. The type A coronary prone individuals are described as fast paced, impatient and irritable. They are deeply involved in their work and deny failure, fatigue and illness. They try to get more and more done in less and less time. They do not care very much about relationships with their co-workers but are very anxious about the opinions of their supervisors. These type A's are twice as likely to develop heart disease as type B people, who may be as successful as type A's, but tend to be calmer, less time urgent, more concerned with quality rather than quantity of work, are more organized, and less prone to frustration. But how does stress cause disease anyway? It seems a little vague to think that, well, people just get stressed and their illnesses increase. But we now know a fair amount about the mechanisms of the general physiological reactions to stress, and we are just beginning to understand the more specific ones. The emergency reaction is under the control of the limbic system of the brain. This part of the brain stimulates the heart to beat faster and it affects the peripheral blood vessels to clamp down. This increases blood pressure. The principal neurotransmitters at these synapses are epinephrine and norepinephrine. At the same time, the sympathetic nervous system stimulates the adrenal medulla to secrete a great deal of epinephrine and some norepinephrine, which are thus doubly assured of reaching their target organs. If the emergency reaction is extreme or long enough, the hypothalamus stimulates the pituitary gland to release ACTH into the blood. The specific physiological reaction which may damage the heart is the type A's extreme responsiveness to situations. Type A's show greater emergency reaction to challenge than do type B's. They shift more often and more extremely into the emergency reaction of high heart rate and blood pressure, as well as the other associated changes, and shift back again. And here's what happens. The constantly increasing and decreasing blood volume can directly weaken the arterial walls. 
The blood clots faster during the emergency reaction, which increases the rate of arthrosclerosis, the formation of deposits on the walls of the arteries. This prevents blood from reaching the heart muscle and is the disease process behind heart attack. In addition to this underlying disease, epinephrine and norepinephrine may precipitate a heart attack because they also make the heart beat irregularly, which is cardiac arrhythmia. Another important recent discovery concerns the immune system. The immune system is the body's defense against diseases and other toxins, and as Jonas Salk once pointed out, has functions similar to that of the brain. The immune system is a highly complex system involving many components. Many researchers believe that the brain regulates the immune system and that the state of the immune system is more important in the development of diseases than the exposure to the disease entities themselves, whether viral or bacterial, or to toxins. Some viruses, like herpes simplex, for instance, are always present in the body, but they only become active when something goes wrong with the immune system. Cells which can become cancerous constantly circulate in the body, but in healthy persons they are routinely eliminated by the immune system. These mutant cells can only take root and multiply when some factor, either genetic or environmental, has suppressed the functioning of the immune system. The immune system is thought by many now to hold the key to curing or preventing cancer and a wide variety of other illnesses, perhaps including schizophrenia. Some of the most exciting research on the brain today involves the effect of psychological processes, especially stress, on immune system functioning. Both specific life events and some personality characteristics affect susceptibility to and recovery from disease. For instance, one recent study showed that how women cope with breast cancer has a greater impact on recovery than the size of the tumor or the type of treatment. New techniques have, however, allowed researchers to directly measure indicators of immune system functioning, and they are beginning to link emotions with some changes in immune system reactions. For example, ten weeks after the death of a spouse, those still bereaved had a tenfold decrease in one kind of immune system responsivity. We are just beginning to understand how mental states such as grief and brain processes affect the immune system. There are many parts to the immune system, and each may bear its own relation to psychological processes, but the reaction is controlled by brain processes, some of which are modifiable. That we are under constant stress is a phenomenon considered by many physicians and scientists to emphasize that we are now unable to regulate ourselves in the contemporary world. The general idea is that our health problems get worse and worse as we move farther and farther beyond our biological inheritance, and the world moves farther and farther beyond our control. But the stress story, although certainly important, does not do justice to the amazing capacity of the brain to regulate our health. What should be more wondered about is how we manage to stay healthy in our complex environment. Most people who are under stress do not get sick. Most people who smoke do not get lung cancer. Most people who grieve do not die quickly. Most people who move and live entirely new lives, get new jobs, get married, get divorced, remain healthy. Our body temperature remains constant. Our heart makes billions of beats on time. Our glands receive the correct chemical messengers, and millions of other regulatory processes go on almost automatically. This brings up an important point. The brain has been designed primarily to run the body and to keep it healthy. The countless extensions of the brain's sensory systems, the complex network of internal, nervous, chemical, and regulatory systems 
all serve primarily to keep us out of trouble. Our balance is maintained. We avoid other people. We do not walk into walls. We eat roughly the right amounts. We stay healthy. The brain is our largest organ of secretion. It produces the most chemicals of any organ in the body. And it should be considered primarily to be the organ of health, our own internal health maintenance organization. Some of the most recent discoveries in brain sciences have enabled us to get a glimpse of how elaborate that innate healing network is and how much we might be able to accomplish were we able to develop drugs and procedures which might allow this innate network to flourish. In one important study in California, a large number of dental patients were given several drugs before their dental work. Some were given pain-killing drugs as normal, but others were given a placebo, an inert drug which is believed by the patient to possess genuine physiological effects. Both groups of people reported little or no dental pain while in treatment. This finding so far is similar to many throughout the world, that inert substances, if they are believed to be genuine, can come to influence the body. This placebo effect has often been maligned in medicine, as if nothing real is accomplished. This is similar to the experience of Esdale, the first person to demonstrate hypnosis to the Royal Society in London. Esdale, in front of an assembled committee of the Royal Society, sawed off the gangrenous leg of a patient while on stage without anesthesia. But his treatment wasn't accepted anyway. It may seem extreme, but members of the Royal Society denied Esdale's report and merely alleged that he had hired a hardened rogue to appear. So, too, the placebo is ignored and is often considered trivial by those researchers who are interested in hard medicine. But this experiment, under the direction of John Levine of the University of California, was different. After administering the placebo to some of his patients, Levine did something else, something quite innovative. He gave half of the patients a dose of naloxone, a drug which blocks the effects of endorphins. It does so by filling the receptor sites so that the endorphins cannot operate. If the placebo were merely foolery, then naloxone should have no effect. But if the placebo activates our own endorphin system, the naloxone would have an effect. The results were very astonishing to many people in neurochemistry. Those people who were given naloxone did not produce the placebo effect. They found the dentistry painful. This means that the placebo effect, in this experiment anyway, may have involved the production of endorphins by the dental patients. They may have produced it due to their belief that they were going to be relieved from pain and activated their own innate pain-killing mechanisms. So the brain may be able to relieve pain by producing chemicals on demand, chemicals that block transmission of the pain signals. Endorphin production has been reported to influence weight, memory, schizophrenic-like symptoms, and many aspects of the immune system. The brain then seems to possess some capacities for healing and self-repair beyond the dreams and certainly beyond the understanding of researchers only a few years ago. It seems to be able to regulate our health far beyond anything that could be done consciously. Norman Cousins has reported that laughter helped him overcome a mysterious disease. Augustine de la Peña has hypothesized that the excessively bored brain may be responsible for cancer. Dr. Frey of the University of Minnesota has found that emotional tears, tears under the control of brain mechanisms, may contain substances that the body needs to expel. And there are numerous new ideas on how mental health and physical health may be quite similar. Here I want to focus on an important and continuous program of the brain, maintaining a proper weight. 
The need to trust innate brain mechanisms is demonstrated by the common problem of attempting to lose weight. People often fight themselves over weight loss. It is a major social concern. It is, as recent brain research indicates, a futile and useless fight. For people love food. The search for the edible and delicious is constant in history and continues now with new cuisines, new restaurants, new food crazes. One commentator writes, Humans will swallow almost anything that does not swallow them first. The animals they relish range in size from termites to whales. The Chinese of Hunan province eat shrimp that are still wiggling, while North Americans and Europeans eat live oysters. Some Asians prefer food so putrefied that the stench carries for dozens of yards. At various times and places, strong preferences have been shown for the fetuses of rodents, the tongues of larks, the eyes of sheep, the spawn of eels, the stomach contents of whales, and the windpipes of pigs. Many other pleasures are associated with foods. Certain foods are thought to be aphrodisiacs. An image of daily love and togetherness might be a family gathered around a holiday table. The cliché has it that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Jewish mothers are well known to cure everything with chicken soup. Our love of and preoccupation with food has had, until recently, great adaptive value. In times when food supply was not reliable enough, those people who gorged themselves when they could get food had more chance of survival. In addition, when most work required expensive enormous amounts of energy, huge meals were needed as fuel for the manual labor. Until recently, there was no central heating, and intemperate climates unheated homes made it necessary to produce the heat from within, from the products of the stomach rather than the tree and the furnace. But the body itself operates like a furnace, and the brain is like the thermostat of that furnace. Weight is gained when there are more calories taken in than are expended. A calorie is a measure of heat production, defined as the amount of energy required to increase the temperature of one gram of water by one degree centigrade. However, losing and gaining weight is not simply a matter of calories eaten, as the perennial diet books have it, because the brain regulates weight around a set point, like the temperature set point on a thermostat. Consider this. You will eat about 50 tons of food in your lifetime, yet your weight rarely varies even as much as one ton. From this point of view, 15 to 20 pounds isn't very much. This set point is the body weight which several brain areas attempt to maintain. The hypothalamus can control eating and drinking and metabolic level to raise or lower caloric expenditure. The set point thus keeps weight around a predetermined level, so it is more difficult both to gain and lose weight than we would predict by merely counting calories. That the brain regulates body weight helps us understand why it is easier to lose weight at the beginning of a diet and harder at the end. At the beginning of a diet, we are far away from our set point. The farther away from the set point we are, the easier weight is to lose. There are common excuses for being overweight. One, I've lost hundreds of pounds in my life, the implication being that it is always gained back. Two, it doesn't matter how much I eat, I am just naturally fat. Three, I can gain weight just looking at food. Recent evidence suggests that these cliches are all true. Here is a fact that may make some people very sad. Some of you are born to be fat. The part of the hypothalamus which regulates weight may simply be set higher in some people. And in addition, different people have different levels of fat cells which are predetermined early on in their development. These factors make losing weight below the set point difficult, if not impossible. 
The problem for people who are considered constitutionally obese is that their own body norms, as expressed in their set points, are higher than the current cultural norm. The naturally obese, then, may face bleak alternatives, either constant hunger or being considered overweight. This innate factor is why people lose and gain weight constantly and why diets don't work. This is why there's always a new diet every year. People are up against a powerful and impenetrable biological barrier. However, there is one consolation for people who seem doomed to never match the skinny ideal of the models in genes ads. For years, it has been assumed that thin people are healthier. Most actuarial tables of the insurance companies reflect this. Obese people pay higher rates for life insurance. It has recently been found that people who live the longest are well above the published norms for weight. In all age and height groups, people who are slightly fat are the healthiest, and the ideal weight for height increases with age. This increase is almost exactly that gained on the average. This means that our brain's automatic regulation is wiser than our current cultural ideal. So being overweight may not be such a losing battle after all. We don't lose much on diets since the regulatory mechanisms of the brain begin immediately to compensate for the fuel shortage by conserving brain's resources. Dieters may recall that they often feel weak and sluggish after a couple of weeks on a diet, but because fewer calories are being burned, there is not a tremendous loss of weight. At the beginning of a diet, when weight may well be above the set point, weight loss occurs fairly quickly. As the weight is lowered, the body strives to maintain its set point, and metabolism is reduced. Therefore, weight is lost less quickly, or not at all. The body's built-in protection against famine makes the set point much higher than the person may desire. Because the body operates on a lower energy requirement during a diet, when you go off a diet and eat normally, weight gain is likely. So weight is kept in a delicate balance, regulated unconsciously by the innate mechanisms of the brain. There is a story told by many survivors of disasters, plane crashes and famines that may bear on all this. This particular one is from the Nazi concentration camps in World War II. Among their very many unsavory experiments, the Nazis determined to discover how fast people would starve given inadequate diets. So they provided inmates with as little as 300 calories a day and charted their bodily changes. In one camp, most of the inmates died on this diet, but one small group had many survivors. When the camps were liberated, the leader of the group was asked why he thought his fellow inmates survived. What did they do? He said, each day, with our meager meal, we all gathered around and talked to each other. We talked about the most wonderful meals we had ever had and the wonderful meals we might have again in the future. We imagined eating roasts and potatoes, cakes and wine. This group survived. Perhaps this means that the brain can receive information about proper weight from sources other than food intake. That is why, too, that looking at food may actually cause weight gain. In one study, those people who saw a sizzling steak increased their insulin production, thus increasing the entry of fat into their cells. They would thus gain weight. So obviously, weight control and weight regulation is a much more amazingly controlled process than the normal calories-in, calories-out idea would have it. But this brings up a much larger point. There may be a mental and a brain involvement in health far beyond our scientific ideas of only a few years ago. One further and final example comes from a recent and massive study of health taking place in Canada. Jana Mossy 
and Evelyn Shapiro studied 3,000 people aged 65 and older. Each person rated their own health from poor to excellent. At the same time, each person was also rated on health by their physicians according to their medical records. The startling finding was this. Those people who were in objectively poor health and rated their health as good had a higher chance of surviving than those people who were in objectively good health who rated their own health as poor. Although there may be many interpretations to these findings, and it is only one study, albeit large, it seems clear that what we believe about ourselves can allow us to conquer pain, to change weight, even survive in difficult circumstances, and change our susceptibility to illness. Obviously, there is much more to discover about the amazing role that the brain can play in health, and they are discoveries that will forever change the face of medicine and our knowledge of what the brain is, what it does, and how it operates.